So, uh, <clears throat> a lot of issues uh, which were addressed. Normally, it is the moment where a lot of questions are asked, not only questions, but statements, if I may. Uh, and I could also see a lot of body languages coming from the audience. I would recommend to be, uh, you to be as uh, clear as possible in your exposition. We have a rapporteur, and uh, we have to facilitate uh, its, uh, his task. Uh, uh, let me only say from my own standpoint that we have a big, big issue, which is monetary policies of central banks, all central banks of the world, and uh, whether or not we consider that we are in a relatively safe side as a uh, uh, Jean-Claude said, or whether it might be a little bit more complex and uh, whether uh, it is, as you said, uh, uh, maybe uh, Larry uh, Summers or, uh, or Blanchard, uh, who's right. Or, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it is, uh, of course, the jury is still, still open there, but we, we could discuss that. We have the issue of cryptocurrencies and the digitalization of uh, the, all the world, of the real economy and of finance, uh, which uh, you address, Abdulaziz, very, very clearly at the very start, and which is an immense issue, and I expect that some of us will uh, intervene. Uh, I, I would myself, under your control, Abdulaziz, say that I would make the difference between the real cryptocurrencies, that are real currencies, if I may, and the crypto assets, that seems to me very much, uh, uh, I would say, speculative assets, uh, respectable speculative assets, but not uh, able to be real currencies, because I am still of the old school of uh, Aristotle, if I may, considering that a currency must be simultaneously a good, store, uh, a good uh, uh, unit of account, a good... Uh, mean of exchange and a good store of value. And when I see the Bitcoin going up and down, up and down, up and down, it seems to me that it is lacking the good store of value qualification, uh, which uh, makes a currency, if I may. But we have a lot of other issues. What I would recommend perhaps for the statements to be made would be perhaps to say, well, we have positives and we have negatives in my view. Uh, in order for uh, for the the communication to be uh, as uh, as uh, easy to understand as possible, because we are in situation in all dimensions of the situation, which uh, comprehends uh, positives and negatives, of course. So, who would first ask for the floor? Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jean Claude, and uh, thank you all for those very informative and uh, insightful presentations. You know, I spent a lot of my life in the International Monetary Fund, so it's hard to shake the habit of looking for risks. And uh, I thought I might just share what I think are perhaps three, three or four risks that we could look at for next year. The first is that <clears throat> it's absolutely right, as, as Jean-Claude and others said, you know, uh, you said at the beginning in opening, Jean Claude, that uh, there is a. The numbers look good in the aggregate. You know, growth numbers look pretty good. But if you disaggregate, you find that there is a very strong, and, and I think some people have called it a dangerous divergence that's happening. So the numbers for Sub Saharan Africa for this year, for next year, are about between three and three and a half percent, which is pretty low for given population growth on average. The numbers for Latin America and South America are very poor. And what is more worrying is that if you look at the numbers, not just for this year and next year, but for the next five years, they have been brought down quite sharply in many emerging markets. So really what has happened is that as a result of each crisis, 2009 crisis, this crisis, the long-term growth rate is brought down in emerging markets. And that's a dangerous uh, long-term prognostic because convergence, you know, is, is becoming 
harder for a lot of those countries. So that, that I think, is something we just need to bear in mind as we look at the next year. In, and the second risk I wanted to mention is that this year we have not seen the debt problems manifesting themselves in, in the kind of debt restructuring or debt defaults that some people feared at the beginning of the year. I think a year ago there was a bit more worry that we would see a few more accidents than we have. Next year we might be surprised the other way because interest rates are going to go up a little bit. Corporate debt is very high in, in some emerging markets. It's built up to levels that would be hard to sustain. Um, a few low-income countries, maybe half a dozen, have debt levels that would be very hard to sustain. And we don't yet have a very good framework for dealing with that. You saw the G30 report that came out. Uh, other reports have come out. So I think we need to be aware that during 2022, we may have more difficult issues dealing with the emerging market and low-income country debt than we have seen uh, this year. So that's the second one. The third one I wanted to say is that, uh, you know, is a question of managing expectations. And I want to say the two, two ways in which I see the risk. One, SDRs. So everybody very happy, 650 billion, it's a big number. Um, you know, the initial allocation was important for many emerging markets and gives them breathing time to, to use that because next year will be a difficult year for many of them. Uh, but if you look at the numbers now, there is a big discussion, say if you take Africa, you know, Africa got 25 billion of the ori ori original allocation. Low income countries got, I think, 5 billion uh, of the, uh, in Africa. So. If you take, as I think of Sub-Saharan Africa, if you think of uh, the various proposals now of reallocating, let's take some of the SDRs that went to the countries that don't need it, let's move it. At the end of the day, the two ideas that are going to get approved, in my view, in the next couple of uh, months will basically take about 70 or 80 billion dollars worth of SDRs and transfer them from national central banks to a holding account in the IMF. That's always going to happen. And then that money will be dispersed over five years, slowly, along with fund programs, subject to policies, subject to debt limits. But the expectation is for much larger and more immediate reallocation. So we have to manage that expectation. And the other expectation, that's my last point, that it's worth managing, is that, you know, when we fell into COVID, everybody fell together into a deep black hole. Within two weeks, the whole world went from doing what it was doing to sort of at the bottom of the pit. And awful, you know. But their small consolation was that everybody was in that space at the same time. And people were struggling to find a solution to it. Now we have the vaccine. But we are coming out of the hole at very different pace. Rich country is pretty much out of the hole now. We are all talking about the post-COVID world. Other countries are coming a little bit behind, but some will take two years before they get vaccinated. And the tolerance of populations who are at the bottom is going to be much less when on their phones, they can see every day how those that have got out are now enjoying themselves and living a normal life, but they are still stuck. And they have to blame people. So the first group they hold responsible is their own governments. And we have already seen an erosion of trust between governments and people. It's already quite low. Riyadh has, has, has gone. But in Lebanon is just one example. You, I can give you half a dozen examples where we have had social explosions, not caused by COVID, but exacerbated by the frustration of populations after living a year in this. And that frustration will only become more acute when they see others doing better. So I guess my, my, my last point was that I, want, I think it's important 
that we also recognize that the management of the social political expectations will become a source of uncertainty which will then impact markets because you will see that many countries or some countries will not be able to contain the, the frustrations of their population in during the coming year. So I just wanted to put some of those risks on the table. Uh, that's, as well. that's very, very useful. And you're absolutely right, of course, uh, as you said, you have such an experience in the IFIs. Uh, clearly, uh, if I uh, memorize the last uh, uh, messages of the IMF, this divide between advanced economy and the emerging one and the lower middle income is absolutely striking. The, re the reviewing of projections was done up for the advanced economy and down for uh, these other economies. So the divide in the world is uh, is alarming, that's clear. And I have to say, but it's a question for, uh, for the audience, I am absolutely struck by the difference of vaccination between, between say, Sub-Saharan Africa, to oversimplify, and Europe. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. And I am struck by the fact that I, I don't see yet, and fortunately, highly fortunately, I hope that there are good reasons for Sub-Saharan Africa to resist the attack of the virus, but, but I mean, the, the dangers and the risks seems enormous. Other Intervention, please. Thank you. Um, I would like to, to second very much what uh, Masoud just said and uh, argue that uh, when you looked at the current situation, you didn't comment on long-term growth prospects. And I wonder whether one could say today that growth prospects after COVID are better than what they were before. And I'm talking about potential growth. And before COVID, we were actually considering that there were risks on the evolution of potential growth. There were discussions about the trend of productivity that were not very encouraging. There had been uh, some coming back in the United States, but still quite timid. So there were questions raised about the future of potential growth. And I don't see how the COVID crisis would actually make us more optimistic about that. So I think one of the long-term risks is indeed what potential will do. There, there may be one reason to be optimistic, which is exactly what uh, Serge said earlier, which is if we shift our view towards sustainability, because there we have a lot of needs of investment, uh, both to mitigate climate change, to adapt to climate change, and to actually provide protection of biodiversity and, and, and so on. So that leads me to the second comment, which is about debt. My own view is that we shouldn't be worried about debt if public spending were well, well used. And that's a big question. Are we confident today that the kind of uh, ease that uh, fiscal policy gave us, which was very needed in the short term, does it bear long-term risks? And I would say it does, except if that spending was well used. And one way to look at it would be, does it, does it make the transition towards sustainability easier? And I'm not sure. I think it's a, it's a question. But I think we should look at that. I, I'm optimistic about public debt because I think that public debt uses the extra savings that if there were no public debt uh, issues, these savings would be used in speculative instruments. So in a way, the fact that uh, there has been a rising public debt has been a factor of stability for financial markets. So that, but then, of course, uh, the risk is whether this money uh, was better used by the government than it would have been by the private investors in speculative uh, items. On speculation, I, I would like to, to rejoin to join, uh, what, what the chairman said about uh, crypto uh, currencies. Um, I, I, found, I, I even found you optimistic when you said that there are cryptocurrencies. Uh, I see crypto assets. Uh, and I think that most of them are highly speculative, and this is no money. And I would add to this three dimension of money, uh, what unifies the three of them is trust. And I don't see, I, I mean, we are in societies where trust needs to be based on something. I, a decentralized trust is speculative. 
So that's something that is very difficult to, uh, uh, to, 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 to maintain. Um, my final uh, comment is a question uh, um, because we have not discussed green finance. And I think that when we look at the financial systems, uh, it probably will be a very important dimension. It is right now uh, the fastest growing segment of financial markets. It's very small. But it seems to me that green finance is a link between what we need in terms of long-term growth prospects, what we need in terms of sustainable uh, development, uh, and what we need to bridge the gap that uh, Masoud uh, commented on between social expectations and economic expectations. So uh, do we believe in green finance and what is needed to, to, to increase the confidence in that movement? Thank you very much indeed. The idea that ESG was very, very important was mentioned. Uh, we, we, of course, are, are badly missing Bertrand Badré because he is the specialist in, the, in the, this uh, panel of, uh, of green finance and unfortunately he could be, couldn't be there, as I said. Thank you very much for, for your remark. I have myself some remarks on your, on many remarks, but I keep it now because I think we have to multiply the intervention. Madam. Do I need the microphone? Uh, I'm, I'm a bit intrigued with the issue of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. I'm not a specialist, but it's a new, um, following the Second World War, John Maynard Keynes, uh, you know, suggested that there will be one currency in the world. And he said, if there is one currency, there will be more equality between nations than no nation would dominate or would be a hegemon on, you know, on the, the global economic market. And we know after First World War, um, the U.S. took all the gold in the world. It had like two-thirds of the gold reserves in the, in the world. The Bretton Woods decided that the currency, no, each country currency is dependent on a certain gold reserve because gold is a scarce uh, commodity. Hello. What happened is the U.S. started, you know, uh, especially with Johnson, um, uh, Johnson um, administration, they started spending, spending, spending. They could no longer link it to the gold, so uh, they, they, it, it was no longer linked to the gold. So Bretton Woods was like dead. And then we had the fiat money, which is the currency based on supply and demand, like any commodity, and. Uh, also with the U.S., with its uh, race with the Soviet Union, starting spending more and more, especially with the arm race with the Soviet Union. And as we see, the, the, the gap between nation is getting more and more. And, and in, each, between, in each nation, the gap between the poor and the rich is getting more because inflation touches the middle class mainly. Because if you have an asset, the asset grows in, in, in value. But if you live from paycheck to paycheck, your paycheck will be, will be worth much less with inflation. Hala, I'm not sure, but what I'm saying, what they, the whole concept of cryptocurrency, that it's decentralized, uh, there is also the concept of scarcity. Do you think like one time, if the cryptocurrency replaces central banks, and it will be one currency in the world, like we won't use any more dollars or dirham or, or euros, and everyone uses cryptocurrency, there will be more equality between nations, and also there will be no more inflation, like you'll have a stable value of the currency. <laughs> will that be possible? I don't know. I'm asking no, you. No, it's so. a good question. It's a good question. We could, of course, spend... Uh, two hours now, uh, because it's a very, very important issue. Uh, in each central bank, you have a member of the highest level of management, which is reflecting on the next cryptocurrency that would be issued by the central bank. So uh, we, 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 in Basel, you have Benoit Curé specializing in uh, optimizing the, the situation from the standpoint of the sanctuary of central banks. And you have the private sector imagining cryptocurrencies. I would dare say that theoretically they are really currencies because they would be based upon a basket of currency. And so the, the value would be, uh, I would say, uh, sure than what we have if the, if with the Ethereum, uh, the, the Bitcoin and the like, which are not at all currencies. The currency is a, a, a joke. 
they are crypto assets. And uh, of course, you have assets that are purely speculative. They found uh, some instruments that are purely speculative. Now, I would say it's a dream to imagine that a cryptocurrency could be the global currency. I don't trust that for, uh, for a minute. Uh, I think that uh, it is very important that somebody is responsible for the currency. And we, until we find out a better institution, central banks are there. They are there to take care of the value of the currency and the trust in the currency, the confidence in the currency. And after all, they are doing that not too poorly, if I may, when I look at what has happened. You mentioned inflation, but the problem of the, at least the advanced economy, was that inflation was not sufficient. It was not at 2%, which is considered right or wrong to be a, some kind of optimum. They were too low, and the materialization of a deflationary risk was there. That's the reason why they were so accommodating, and their policy were so accommodating, which has, of course, a lot of uh, uh, unfortunate byproduct also. Of, uh, the, all this is quite complex. But what I would suggest is to have an, another look at the situation. When central banks are committing themselves in the medium and long run to say we are anchoring inflation expectations on 2%, and as I said, it's the case for a number of major central banks, it is the equivalent of, something, uh, of an anchor. The anchor is the arithmetic anchor, 2%. And uh, if a, a central bank loses totally its, uh, its uh, uh, anchoring goal, then it, look, it, it, it loses its credibility. And uh, that, that is very grave, I have to say. So I prefer, to be frank, uh, a planet where you have a number of central banks saying, I will deliver to my own fellow citizens something like 2% per, per year over a long period of time. I prefer that to a gold uh, anchor that would be totally erratic also and uh, could uh, drive us to abnormal situation. And certainly it is much better than some kind of crypto instruments that nobody is caring for. Uh, so I stop there because, as, as I said, we could, we could discuss that for a very, very long uh, period of time. But I reserve the right to discuss with you in the corridor. And I, I think that many of us would like to do that, including our rapporteur. Uh, please, madame. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the um, uh, interesting presentations. I'm not a money or finance specialist, so I'm learning... Uh, Quite a lot. I, I'm, I work at IFRI on technology, so I was interested uh, to hear about crypto and Bitcoin, but I would like to know as well, uh, um, you know, from your various experiences, how you approach the uh, quantum revolution um, as quantum computers will probably, supposedly, um, uh, thanks to their um, computation, uh, computing capacities, um, and especially be useful for factorization and pose serious cybersecurity threats uh, in terms of um, uh, current uh, encryption mechanisms. And so I was wondering how that's uh, taken into account in your various institutions, and as well as the uses maybe of quantum computers for um, financial optimization. So that's general question about quantum tech in your various capacities. <laughs> a very good question indeed. Uh, I have to say that Scientific American has an article on uh, your, to try to elaborate on your question every month, if I'm not misled. Uh, who wants to take the floor to elaborate on quantum computing and the last uh, very, very important uh, breakthrough in this domain? Jean-Claude, no? <laughs> I think that it was a very good question, and we are all meditating on the appropriate response. No, we have a response there. Uh, speak up. Yeah, I'm, I'm a medical doctor, but I happen also to be a mathematician. I'm by no means a specialist of number theory and quantum stuffs. But what I can say is that there are threats from a cybersecurity point of view. 
However, there is a deep, deep mathematical result uh, about the fact that P uh, is not equal to NP. I won't go into the detail on this Kabbalistic way of thinking of mathematician, but it means that uh, uh, this is a conjecture, it's not really uh, settled today, but a large, large part, like 99% of uh, the specialists think that P is not equal to NP, which means in our daily world that there should not be a break uh, of cryptography security, meaning that we can settle, uh, even with computing uh, power, uh, some a cryptographic system that can't be broken by quantum computers, which is something like quite relieving, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. It is half reassuring because if it had been demonstrated, as you know, the guy would get a billion dollars, if I'm not misled, no? So uh, it's, it's not yet <laughs> solved. <laughs> so the billion dollar offered by a foundation is not that. It's one of the seven very important mathematical problems that are unsolved, and one of them, one of the seven, has been solved. Uh, you're, yeah. So, but thank you very uh, much, Madame. Maybe briefly, oh, please, if you don't mind, on please. quantum. Uh, so, uh, it is expected that quantum computing would be more largely available in five to ten years. So today, you have post-quantum cryptography, because what you need is to protect the data that uh, you store, and that might be exploited later. We know that China is hacking uh, data that are encrypted because they expect to be able to decrypt this data uh, more rapidly than others. Uh, you have big progress in quantum communication, quantum censoring, and quantum computing. Today, uh, you have quantum as a service. So on some financial institution, chemical uh, uh, industries, are using this, it's quite cumbersome. You must prepare your calculation quite in advance. You go, you run extremely fast. Uh, and you see big progress, notably from Australia, in quantum sensoring that will provide the stability because you have a problem of stability in your quantum computers. So it's not such a theoretical issue. That's the only point I wanted to mention. Very inspiring. And so uh, I must confess I am, I had uh, some uh, mathematical education too, I remain a little bit skeptical uh, after having read a, a lot of articles on really the possibility of, uh, of making absolutely fantastic breakthrough, but, but we will see. And in any case, uh, we know so little things on quantum mechanics itself, on, uh, I would say, the way the world functions and the nature uh, with all the uh, her mysteries function, so uh, we, we have to, to be prepared for any kind of new scientific uh, discoveries. And, but thank you very much for your question. Other intervention, please, you have the floor. My name is uh, Gilles Guérin, I'm a private banker and I deal with high net worth individuals and on top of that I'm the treasurer of this World Policy Conference. Uh, we're facing at the moment in China a very big default. I mean, it's already called the Lehman Brothers of China for $300 billion with Evergrande and the only solution seen at the moment is a 75% haircut. So don't you think that will affect the trust of the investors in emerging markets regarding the bond, the next bond issue, and they will look twice before investing in, despite the, the interest rate and the tenor? Very good question again for all of us, uh, not especially the speakers, but all, all of us. My, my own sentiment uh, in one minute is that uh, uh, there are a lot of problems in the, the domestic uh, economy in China, a lot of uh, abnormal level of debts in many, many entities, uh, private and public entities, uh, local authorities and so forth. It's a problem which is very well documented since quite a long period of time, calls for uh, restructuring, reshaping, and we will see what happens uh, for this problem, which is really a big one and perfectly accepted by the Chinese uh, uh, authorities, if I may, as one of the, their major problems. Now, this is a particular point. I, I have a tendency to exclude a new Lehman Brothers, 
because we had the experience of Lehman Brothers. I had myself the experience of Lehman Brothers. I remember talking to the Secretary of Treasury and to, to my colleague in the US, and at the very moment they were hesitating. Uh, uh, they had no private solution, so they didn't want to embark on a public solution, and they were clearly not in the central bank, but in the Treasury, under assessing the immense consequences of uh, the uh, collapse. I don't suggest that they should have avoided the collapse. I'm, uh, I hesitate to say that because uh, I would say more generally the public opinion in, in the US was not ready for a big uh, public money investment to avoid the catastrophe. So it was very complex economically, financially, and politically. All that being said, the experience is there, so I cannot help thinking that the authorities in China will understand that they have to, uh, I would say, manage the situation and not let the thing go, uh, Lehman Brothers-like. But we will see, of course. And you're absolutely right to uh, ask the question. Uh, in any way, we, we have to be fully aware of the risks that are at stake. Mazoud was very clear on that. We have assets and liabilities in the present situation. We have positives and negatives, and we must be as exhaustive as possible if we want to be, to be, to be fair. Uh, and we have th still uh, 30 minutes, but uh, no more than 30 minutes. Uh, we have to be, to be concise. If I may, I take advantage of the fact that I, I don't want uh, anybody to ask for the floor at this stage. And under the control of the speakers, uh, on crypto, we, we said, we mentioned, I think, uh, quite a lot. Uh, but again, all central banks are reflecting on their own crypto currency issuing. And uh, it is for the, for the commercial banks very, very important because if you have the central bank giving you an account in crypto uh, currency, then what about the deposit in the commercial banks? So it totally changed the business model of the commercial banks. So it has to be looked after very, very, very carefully by, by the central bank. It is what they are doing, by the way. They don't want to destroy the banking system. But they, they cannot let uh, blockchain and all the technology that Abdulaziz has, has mentioned only in the hands of those that are uh, uh, inventor uh, of, uh, of crypto, uh, uh, I would say, uh, assets uh, that are uh, purely that are largely speculative. Uh, uh, another word, perhaps, on ESG, because I, we had no time to address it too much. This is very important. It, there is a, an immense problem at the global level. Whether or not we will have, as regards the new non-financing reporting on climate and on S and G, uh, some kind of core of regulations uh, standards at the global level. As you know, there are a lot of meditation on that. G7 has been on that. The uh, G20, the IFRS are reflecting on the setting up of a new board that would be specialized at a global level in this kind of standards. Uh, I expect that the decision could be taken quite rapidly now uh, in the occasion of uh, the next uh, COVID, uh, uh, meet, not COVID, uh, uh, the, the next uh, green meeting at the global level. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we will see exactly, but, but this is a very important issue. And of course, the way investors will take into account ESG, the green uh, finance, which can grow very rapidly, but also the greenwashing, which uh, has been uh, more or less uh, underlined uh, is, as a problem, and the green bubble and so forth. I mean, we have an immense domain there to reflect upon. Uh, I think that we, what we said on potential growth, if I may, my own reflection would be uh, productivity progress had a very, very important slowing down, more or less, in 2006, 2007. It was before, in a way, before the, the subprime, before the, the last, uh, the, the former crisis of uh, Lehman Brothers. And we are in that situation since then. 
with some signs that we are getting out. We were getting out immediately before COVID. I hope very much that uh, we will, we are getting out. Uh, some were arguing that we were experiencing the famous solo paradox, namely that there were a lot of investment in digitalization, but no results in terms of uh, productivity growth. I trust that it is likely that we have a phenomenon of that kind. It was very abnormal to see at the moment where there was a technology, technological surge that uh, all uh, productivity progress were slowing down. In any case, it is also, the, in some way, it's a multidimensional problem, but the re responsible for the extraordinary low inflation and extraordinary accommodating uh, policies of central banks. So we, we, we have a, a set of uh, characteristics of the functioning of our economy, which was really very adverse. And one of the positive or negative for the future is whether or not we get out of that. If we get out of that with more productivity progress, more growth, then we are on the positive side and uh, we will have a post-COVID uh, I would say, uh, evolution of growth that would be much more flattering. The negative would be that, no, uh, we, it do, does not change. Uh, we are, and uh, there are eminent uh, uh, economists that are uh, claiming that uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere. And then we would be in a very negative position because, because the, position, the, the 10 years since uh, Lehman Brothers are not sustainable in the very long run. That's absolutely clear. It's not sustainable. So uh, what is not sustainable will not be sustained and, and a, a new crisis will occur. Uh, central banks cannot be eternally extraordinarily accommodating. That's one, also one of the reasons I, well, I, I am a little bit prudent on the interest rates. I hear that we are tranquil and uh, the interest rates would be low for 10 years. Not sure. <laughs> there are, again, <laughs> positive scenario and negative scenario in this respect. And, uh, um, I, I don't think we should be too confident. In any case, of course, if inflation gallops, then uh, the uh, interest rates uh, will go up and up and nominally will go up. Not necessarily the real interest rates, but certainly the nominal interest rates. And markets are very sensitive to nominal interest rates, obviously, so at least uh, at the moment of the transition. So uh, I, I stop there. Uh, only to, to say, uh, to conclude my very short remarks, debt is a big question. It is not because there is no debt problem today in the eyes of the investors that you won't have debt problems tomorrow. I had known myself a moment where Greece had no problem to finance itself before Lehman and even after Lehman. Nine months after Lehman, Greece had no problem to finance itself. The market, we should never forget that, is totally binary. It, it's up or down. It's one or zero. And uh, uh, at the moment, the new government in Greece happened to be there and said the situation is graver. It was the start of a total catastrophe. And when you have one country or one entity that has problem, and that, uh, there we have the Chinese uh, entity in question. If you have a problem, then, then there is a contagion. Contagion is unavoidable. Human nature is probably behind. But, uh, but then we had Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Italy. And we had five countries that were tranquil uh, for a long period of time and were trapped in a sudden stop of financing. So. I exclude really nothing personally, and I think that uh, all entities, private and public, and all countries have to remain quite vigilant and not to lose the fact that they, their creditworthiness depends on the confidence of uh, investors and uh, savers uh, in their own country and the world over. So it's, it is very, very important. But I, sp I spoke too long. And uh, we still have a lot of time. So uh, who wants to take the floor? On, yeah. Do, do you want to, uh, Serge? Serge? So, Chairman, if you give me the floor, I will naturally take it. Thank you. Now, a number of things. Uh, first of all, um, yes, I agree with some of the remarks made by uh, Masood and um, uh, 
regarding the, uh, the, the, um, the question of the uh, 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 the concern about the uh, the, cr the uh, recovery. Uh, I understand that. However, Sub-Sahara is diverse, as you know. Um, in our very region, I have to say that I'm, I'm puzzled by the optimisms of the of the different ministers of finance. When I sit in the uh, in the Council of Ministers of Finance, I'm really puzzled by the energy, the willingness of doing things. When you look at you know uh, ministers like you know Cote d'Ivoire, Benin, Senegal, they're very optimistic. You see, so there's there's energy that needs to be captured, and I have to say that you know it, it is um, it is it is amazing. All right, this is one. The second thing is. You have mentioned this question of uh, SDR. The SDR allocation, it is, it is an interesting thing because if the SDR allocation are not subject to reforms, uh, they will be considered as helicopter money. You see, easy money. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it should be a give and take. Otherwise, you know, why should I reform my my economy when you know at some point i'll get some money free lunch you see so that's why i think it is a way through it is a real way through so that's why we need to see um the strengths and how strong the hand of the different head of states from the g20 namely president macron uh the chancellor whoever the new chancellor would be uh and the new u.s administration we need to see how strong their hand will be facing this situation and i agree that the the allocation in terms of quantum for africa is way too low no doubt about it, no doubt about it. Any other question of stability, um, SDR, yes, fundamentally, yes. It is a, it is a true yes. And uh, prior, uh, uh, before joining the West African Development Bank, I can, I can tell you, I've, I was pitching, uh, I can give the name, I was pitching Total in London. And I was pitching them about their, uh, uh, it, was a, it was a green bond. They were thinking about it. That was three years ago. And I have to say that pitching total for a green bond, it is by itself something that needs to be considered, by itself. And we have the same discussion with BP, with Shell, etc. So by itself, by itself, it is, it is, a, it is, a, it is, a, it is a, a, a proof that something is happening and needs and things need from that perspective. Things needs to happen. So I agree with you fundamentally. I agree with you. Climate, EAG, and I agree also with you. Uh, Bertrand should should have should 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 have been with us. I think his uh, his expertise. Um, we are working with him at the, at the West African Development Bank, and I can tell you his expertise in that matter is really serious. Thank you. That is for me. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed, Serge. Abdulaziz, I know that you have new rendezvous, but we would be very happy if you can give us your no, last you see, message. In the GCC here, I mean, there is a big, strong drive to also for employment for nationals, because in the UAE, in the banking sector, we have, you know, 30% of employees are national and the rest are expatriate. But I think uh, our government also should realize that moving forward with this, all this shift in consumer behavior, customer behavior, automation, digitization, I think in the next 10 years, 50% of our employment in the banking will disappear. So we, and that will also be applied to a lot of other industries. So what are we going to do with the surplus of employee who's been, you know, good in their job, but the job is no longer is available? So, okay, yes, investment banker, maybe they are protected, you know, uh, but I think most of the retail banking, most of them, even commercial banking, automation is just and digitization is taken over. So I think that's an issue for our government also, and we have to prepare the people for a transition. And we, for that, we need growth. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Abdulaziz. We appreciate enormously your presence and your messages. And we will continue to meditate for a few minutes on the, this last message. Thank you very much indeed. Well, clear enough.
Of course, digitalization means uh, a formidable transformation of our economies and on services, and uh, we, we have to, to be fully aware of that. Uh, um, and it's not only commercial bank, of course, it's, it's all the service industry and, you know, perhaps less, as, he, as Abdullah says, but, but perhaps less investment banks, but, 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 Madam, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chen. Thank you very much for a very interesting intervention, interventions and, and also the comments uh, made, and I fully agree with Mahmoud who said, has said that we have to really uh, think about the threats there are. Uh, it can be a very bumpy road. And uh, actually, after these uh, very good growth years, which we are experiencing now and next uh, uh, year, all the old problems and challenges are there. And that concerns especially uh, the European Union. And a good question is, uh, when it comes to debt burdens, uh, uh, what will happen in Italy? Will Super Mario, uh, is he able to, to make it uh, or, or not? And, and that is not only uh, the case uh, of Italy. I think many countries, also my country, Finland, struggle with low productivity. And the COVID crisis has been a very uh, good excuse not to implement those structural reforms which are needed. Uh, so, and now with the new chancellor, uh, probably <laughs> uh, from a new uh, party, SPD, uh, from uh, Olaf Scholz, is uh, very um, kind of obvious that between him and uh, President Macron, uh, there will be some changes, maybe cha not changes in the uh, growth and stability pact, but um, at least uh, uh, in ways how we interpret it. Uh, so there are kind of many question marks also in, in, in Europe and uh, especially when it comes to uh, implementing uh, those structural reforms which are needed in, in most of the countries. Uh, is there enough uh, willingness really to do, do that or not? Very good remark, obviously. And uh, what strikes me uh, as regards Europe is that uh, uh, we are more or less communicating as if there was a single recommendation for all countries, a single motto, if I may. And, of course, there is a single monetary policy, but the, the recommendation for each particular country should be very different because Finland is not Germany and Germany is not Italy and uh, Italy is not the Netherlands. For, for instance, for me, it's very clear, Germany is in a situation of enormous amount of uh, current account surplus, very good fiscal position before COVID, and has uh, room for maneuvering and should utilize some room for maneuvering for the sake of Germany and for the sake of the system as a whole. Uh, Italy and France, for instance, uh, have... <laughs> you know, to be cautious and prudent, in my opinion. And it's not at all the recommendation that uh, we would give to Germany. And Finland has its own problem. <laughs> and, uh, and, I mean, structural reform, by the way, are of the essence for all European countries, it seems to me. At least all those who are not at uh, full employment. And it's the case of Finland, if, I, if I'm not misled. It's a case, of, of course, uh, of a number of other countries. And uh, the first goal should be to arrive through structural reforms and good management to full employment. But that's another story. Uh, we have another. Yeah, please, madam. Um, thank you. Um, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in finance or monetary, but I would like to build on some of the questions and some of the things that were mentioned in here. Uh, build back better you know, and build, and, and I look at it from the perspective of livelihoods and people's kind of, you know, um, uh, dignified way of living. And of course, we talked about inflation, and my colleague Dania mentioned how much as well it will impact people's livelihoods. There are, you know, high-level monetary policies, decisions that could be taken, are the depth as well, you know, levels and how the high they are. And of course, we heard the example of Lebanon, which is striking about how much all of the policies or maybe gaps in policies where it led. So 
What I would like to ask here is, given your experience, is how people in a participatory way could engage in accountability measures towards, for example, central banks and others. Of course, there is the regulatory frameworks, there is, of course, the systems and, you know, all of that. But what kind of, you know, um, engagement or role uh, could be taken to to monitor such policies, but also to ensure that they are linked to social protections policies that helps people. So in a way, mechanism of accountability for decisions that could harm people's lives. Thank you for, for uh, your question. I stand ready to respond to your question, but we are at the end and I wanted to, to be sharp uh, in uh, the close of our uh, very, very stimulating meeting. So uh, what I would do at this stage, perhaps, is to, to give the, the, the floor to Jean-Claude, to Jacques, and to Serge again, and uh, if, he, if he wishes, uh, for the last word. I, and I would say a few words myself and respond to your question. So, Jean-Claude, what would you say uh, to comment on the very, very stimulating no, uh, questions and observations? Uh, I was, as you said, today very optimistic and you all of you uh, have shown the risks and I must say that I share your views about the risks that's all <laughs> no you said you said that uh, we had to remain vigilant if I'm not misled so so you accept that there are risks but but yeah we have, have to, to remain extremely the main message was careful and uh, uh, of course this pandemic crisis has created an enormous inequality among the countries, among the countries, among the people uh, who were in bad conditions and poor, and who are poor today, uh, even though there has been social measures by the governments, and among the world between the rich countries and poor countries. And indeed, the growth of uh, uh, countries which are poor is a problem and uh, is, uh, is getting to be a real problem, and we should help to finance these problems. I must say, at the same time, I remain optimistic for one reason about the debt. I remember three or four years ago, we were, all, all, all of us were concerned by the debt. Today, we talk about the debt, but at the same time, the debt is managed extremely well, thanks to the low interest rates and to all the inflows of money. Uh, that we, we, we have. So, in life, I think we have to remain optimistic, uh, in a nutshell, because if we are not, then we are depressed, <laughs> which is another cliche. Okay, this is a, a nice way of uh, concluding your remark. Uh, Jean, uh, Jacques. Yes, so as far as I'm concerned, maybe uh, it's by uh, profession, I'm more inclined to be cautious and uh, to be pessimistic. We didn't speak about the unwinding uh, of all these uh, stimulus packages, uh, interest rate holidays, uh, loan deferrals, and so forth. So when this program came come to an end, um, we might have also socially and economically some negative impact. So uh, I think uh, we shouldn't underestimate also the consequences of the phase out of this uh, stimuli uh, and the uh, support packages. Um, in, it's a pity indeed that uh, our colleague, uh, our expert uh, uh, for energy transition, is not with us. It's true that um, for banks today it's extremely difficult to navigate because the framework are not, have not been stabilized yet, taxonomy are not yet finalized. Um, we have to avoid, by all means, uh, greenwashing, and um, and also what we understand, what is under preparation, is more uh, in terms of taxonomy, is more um, to the attention of investors, asset measures, and um, it gives definition and picture at a certain time, but what we would appreciate as lenders, as bankers, is to accompany the transition, to accompany the energy transition of uh, our counterparts, not to take a picture at a certain time, what is green, what is not green, 
and uh, notably for these uh, sensitive industries what is important is uh, the progress uh, made the roadmap design uh, to uh, all the iteration uh, towards energy transition so it's very complex today uh, from a regulatory perspective uh, for, and um, difficult uh, a lot of communication uh, and we have to be very Serge mentioned that uh, when you pitch for Total, uh, is not obvious, uh, or BP and so forth. Um, these uh, measures or national oil producers at the moment are working very hard to design uh, a, a very serious, rigorous uh, ESG framework. Um, but uh, we are in need of uh, regulations and clarification uh, for this uh, green, uh, green financing. Thank you very much, uh, Jacques, indeed. And uh, I, I understand pretty well that, for, seen from your own standpoint, uh, the challenges are enormous. Uh, what would you say, Serge? One last word, uh, Mr. President. Two lessons learned from our past experience and from the, uh, from the, um, uh, from the last crisis. The first one was that the um, the financial system was could be could have been better regulated. I think you remember that that period. And the second one was one of the second one was um, the uh, financial institution back then were undercapitalized. And it, w when you look at things today, that's no longer the case. And this has been very a powerful shield in this crisis, with an exception, emerging countries emerging countries. So I believe that based on this experience, we should extend this to the emerging country world, where when you look at things in details, institutions are way, way, way too undercapitalized. So to face the situation, the new situation, which is more commitment for the people, more commitment for the population, sustainability, sustainable growth, we need financial institutions that are way, way, way better Capitalized. That's my motto. I think you have all understood that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you very, very much indeed, Serge. So, uh, <clears throat> my own last word, because uh, we, we address so, so many issues, uh, only to mention the fact that uh, it's true that uh, market economies and the entire world proved resilience, and uh, that perhaps gives some, <laughs> some uh, flesh to... Uh, the idea that we can remain relatively confident. Uh, we had the, uh, I, I was myself president of the Paris Club when we had to reschedule Latin America, Africa, Soviet Union, and so forth. And we went through that terrible experience. We had the dot-com bubble explosion. We had uh, Lehman Brothers. We had the Euro crisis. Uh, we had, uh, we have COVID. And uh, we found out pragmatically uh, the way of uh, coping with this situation. Uh, some were thinking that the Euro area would totally collapse and be blown up. Uh, I was convinced uh, that it was plain wrong. Uh, by the way, after Lehman Brothers, four new countries get got in the Euro area, four new countries, and no countries left. So those in... Uh, uh, say on the other side of the Atlantic that we are absolutely sure that everything will be blown up, we are wrong, obviously, and uh, of course we are wrong because there, there was uh, appropriate decisions taken, appropriate, uh, uh, I would say, way of coping with a very grave situation. So there, there is resilience, but of course uh, uh, we have to know that there is no time for absence of vigilance. Everything can happen any time. And uh, we have to be prepared for uh, the unexpected. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that we have been quite exhaustive in listing the risks today, but we will have new events or risks tomorrow. We were not mentioning at all geostrategy, which is nevertheless one very important uh, uh, meditation in this colloquium. And of course, we could have dramatic events that would totally uh, uh, change our perspective. Now, uh, I respond to your, to your question. Uh, the uh, central banks are independent, which does not mean that they 
are not responsible. And all central banks, to my knowledge, are very often uh, in uh, uh, contact with the parliaments, the representative of the people. It's true in the euro system because each national central bank has to make report on the uh, uh, national central banks and the president of the uh, ECB goes at least six times a year uh, in front of the European Parliament, uh, different commissions and the plenary session, which is quite impressive, I have to say. The plenary session in the, in the European Parliament, <laughs> you have the feeling that it is science fiction because there are so many, so many MPs. So uh, th that, that's one. Second, the treaty itself, uh, of course, calls for uh, the central bank to deliver price stability, at least the Maastricht Treaty, and to support the policies of the European Union when price stability is ensured, uh, without prejudice to price stability, etc. So <clears throat> that makes also the central bank, and uh, it, it has been the case, uh, I have to say constantly, to have this addition of responsibilities. Now, you, the central bank is responsible before the people. And uh, the most grateful, uh, I would say, observation I can make is that when at the beginning of the Euro, a lot of people were extremely skeptical and convinced that it would be a failure, convinced that it was impossible to think that it could be a credible currency and so forth. At the moment I'm speaking, in the last survey, 75% of the people that are in the Euro area approve the Euro. 75. More than 80% in Germany. More than 70% in France, to my, in my memory. So, in a way, the central bank proved that it could inspire the confidence of the general public, I mean, uh, of, the, of the men and women in the street. And uh, that, that, of course, is very interesting. Now, we are living in democracies. New questions are coming permanently, and that's absolutely right. And uh, central banks have to reflect on whether some of their instruments are not creating inequalities, whether it's right uh, to embark on uh, <coughs> asset purchases uh, in, w when you have no more, uh, I would say, interest rates uh, uh, possibilities. It's been the case in all major central banks. I consider that the question is perfectly uh, right. Uh, I also consider, of course, that uh, had they let uh, deflation to materialize, then the general public would have been in a dramatic situation and we would have had you know, something which could have been worse than in 2930s of the last century. So, all what you do has, uh, you know, good and bad consequences. You have to balance that and be sure that you take the right decision. But at the last resort, in an independent central bank, it seems to me that you are responsible in front of the public at large. That's, that would be my last word, and it is, uh, it is two minutes after time. So thank you very, very much indeed for uh, active and vivid participation. Thank you.